So if you've been with us in the class, um, you know that we finally got the American Revolutionary War fought and won uh, in the last video's uh, uh, lecture. What I'd like to do now is turn our attention to the post-war period and the creation of Republican, small r, Republican institutions. Now, before I go any further, uh, Republicanism was sort of the catch-all word that was used by virtually everybody in revolutionary colonial America before and during the outbreak of the war. Um, but Republicanism, as you will find out, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For your notes, what Republicanism really refers to is a form of government that is not inherited. In other words, this is the opposite of a monarchy. In order to have political power in a republic, you need to go out and earn the votes um, or the approval of your constituents. And uh, the way that it works in American life is that at that point you represent those constituents in some lawmaking body. Okay. Now, a common mistake that a lot of people, students and otherwise, make when it comes to the aftermath of the American Revolutionary War is to assume that everybody was on the same page. Um, everybody was not on the same page. Um, I think it's safe to assume everybody did not like what they were getting out of um, the British in the uh, revolutionary period that led up to the war. Um, that can be agreed upon relatively easily, but uh, when it comes to the world that they had envisioned after the war, that, that was very different. Um, John Adams had some pretty different ideas as opposed to somebody like a Thomas Jefferson. Let's start out with Adams. Now, Adams was an intellectual, and he was one of the uh, loudest voices for American independence and against the violation is what he saw as uh, American rights. But Adams is what I will describe as a conservative Republican. Now, I don't mean people like um, Rick Perry or Sarah Palin or somebody like that. I, I, I simply mean somebody who was less than, less than trusting of the democratic, small d democratic process. John Adams understood that, you know, in, in some instances you could, you could trade tyrants. You could, you could remove the king as a tyrant and trade him for 2,000 tyrants that were one mile away. In other words, there is such a thing as too much democracy. In a democratic republic where everybody gets one vote and one vote counts no more than anybody else's vote, you could have things that are very, very popular. Um, various policies or programs that are very popular, but not all that well effective. So if you have everybody being able to vote, you could have what Adams and other people like him refer to as the tyranny of the majority. Okay, So Adams makes all of this public even before the war is won, well before the war is won. So I need you to understand that this conservative Republican spin on um, the, uh, the post-war period a very conservative approach to government. Okay? Now, it's very ironic that uh, he was married to a lady by the name of Abigail Adams, and um, one of the things that Abigail told John Adams, um, John Adams was later elected as the first vice president of American, uh, in, in American history, don't forget about the ladies. Um, don't forget about the ladies when you are in this position of power. Because when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and said that uh, all men are created equal, he meant everybody, including women, too. So through people like Abigail Adams, women are beginning to seek a public voice. And this is really a game changer. Now, you also had other people like Judith Sargent Murray, who wrote a piece called On the Equality of the Sexes. And what she did is she really indulged the male stereotype when it comes to why women should not be voting and simply said, you know, the guys are right. We're not ready to vote because we're not smart enough to vote. Now, she didn't really mean that women were unintelligent or didn't have the brain power to go ahead and participate in the democratic process. What she really meant was that in, in certain regions, women were not allowed to attend public schools and things of that sort and so therefore what she was pushing for is more or less as a public education of women okay and using this is almost like an excuse to take public education of women to the next level um, literacy rates begin to rise all across the north simply because what Murray is saying is 
once we're able to read and write, in other words, once we're quote unquote educated, there will be one fewer excuse for the guys not to be able to give us the franchise, give us the vote. Now, back to our discussion with respect to how much is too much power. Keep in mind, everybody, that one of the things that we were very concerned about as we were um, fighting this revolution or war, and even before we, uh, war broke out, was a strong centralized governing body, strong centralized power. We felt that that was very, very dangerous. And so, so one of the things that we were adamant about is once we get our independence, we are absolutely not going to be like the British. We are not going to have power concentrated in the hands of a strong central government because that tends to lend itself well to tyranny. Okay? So a long time before the war ever ended, as a matter of fact, this is in 1777, the Continental Congress passed something called the Articles of Confederation. A very, very important document here. Okay? And what the Articles of Confederation did is they served as, or at least they temporarily served as, our governing documents. Uh, the governing documents that would guide and govern American democracy. And because we were so worried about the abuses of a strong central government, the Articles of Confederation set up a very weak central government. That's worth writing down. The Articles of Confederation afforded a weak central government. So under the Articles, the federal government would not have very much power. Uh, it would be the state or regional governments that would have a lot more power. And the thought was pretty simple. I mean, not only were we fighting a war against a strong centralized government, but moreover, you know, who knew Virginia better than Virginians? Who knew what was best for New York uh, outside of New Yorkers? And so the idea was give the people at the closest levels uh, the most power in terms of government, and this will lend itself well to, you know, freedom, equality, and opportunities, okay? Now, here's the problem with the Articles of Confederation. On paper, they sound great, right? On paper, they're really, really good. The problem is, when you go to implement them, it's a completely different story. One of the things that we found out after the war was that there were really specific reasons as to why the British government was doing some of the things that it was doing. Specific reasons that it taxed, specific reasons that it regulated its economy, specific reasons that it passed laws that said, look, British parliamentary law will remain supreme. And so therefore, what I'd like you to understand about this, uh, really the crux of um, the Articles of Confederation when it comes to their failures can be boiled down to three points. Number one, um, because the federal government was so weak, the central government, the national government, states would get into disputes, border disputes or likewise, and these disputes would just go on and on and on and on and on simply because the Articles of Confederation didn't say who was in charge. And so it's not like this, the, the federal government can step in and play the role of referee and say, look, this is how it's going to be. So no ability to resolve disputes between the states. Furthermore, it didn't give it the ability to set one permanent um, economic code. In other words, if the United States wanted to pass a trade policy that made um, foreign textiles, for example, more expensive, uh, put a tax on them to encourage American buyers to buy American textiles, it, it couldn't do anything like that. I mean, South Carolina had its economic policy and New York had its economic policy and Virginia had its economic policy and Massachusetts had a different one altogether. And so this is not only going to be confusing, it's also going to be really difficult to get the American economy off the ground. But the really, really pressing issue was the whole issue regarding taxation. Under the Articles of Confederation, the only entity of government that had the ability to tax the people directly would have been the state government. The federal government cannot impose taxes directly on the people. Okay. Now the reason that this was so problematic was we were in debt up to our eyeballs and unless the government's going to have a way, a centralized way to pay off that debt, um, we're, we're really looking at going broke. I mean, so the Articles Confederation, even though they sounded great on paper, they almost killed the United States even before there was such a thing as the United States. 
Now, there is one important silver lining that we should probably talk about with respect to the articles, and that was its ability, as far as the federal government was concerned, to settle disputes in Western lands. And the shorthand way of understanding this is it gave the federal government the ability to, to, to organize new territories in the West. Now, keep in mind, once we won the Revolutionary War, we, we were given things that were west of the Appalachian Mountains, so future states of places like Ohio or Alabama, those can now be integrated into the U.S. under the powers of the federal government according to the Articles of Confederation. Now why that's important is, is it will be discussed in just a few minutes, but for the time being I want to give you a really vivid example in terms of how and why sometimes it makes sense to have a strong central government. So, in the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, uh, we were, in some cases, in debt so bad that we could not pay our veterans for their service in the war. Now, this is problematic for a number of different reasons, but one of those veterans was a guy by the name of Daniel Shays, S-H-A-Y-S, Daniel Shays, and he had served um, in the American Revolutionary War, was really, really well accomplished, as a matter of fact. He was from Massachusetts, and in the aftermath of the war, he said, it's one thing for me to serve and you not to pay me, but it's another thing for a quote-unquote faraway government to be taxing me at the same time. So when you think faraway government, I mean, I don't know about you, but I used to think about you know, London. That was a faraway government, uh, you know, 2,000 miles away across the Atlantic Ocean telling us how we have to live our lives. That was a faraway government. The faraway government that Shays is talking about is actually in Boston, right? Now, Massachusetts is a relatively small state, so if Shays views Boston as a faraway government, imagine how he must think of the federal government. That might as well be on another planet for all he's concerned, okay? So what happens is Shays leads what comes to amount to a series of uh, riots. They're called Shays Rebellion, and Massachusetts is in Big, big trouble. Governor James Bodine, he's having a lot of trouble putting this thing down. Now think about this. If riots were to break out in any Amer American city in this day and age, and the local authorities were not able to respond to it adequately, you would call in the National Guards, right? Well, there is no National Guards, and even if there were, uh, the federal government doesn't have the ability to support it simply because it's not taking in the kind of revenue it needs to do those kind of things. So my point with telling you Shays or telling you about Shays Rebellion is that Shays Rebellion is demonstrating the need for a stronger central government, demonstrating that there are in fact times when it does make a lot of sense to have a strong central government that can do things like tax the people directly, do things like um, in certain instances if if there is some sort of regional emergency insert itself into the situation um, certainly that's what you see when you see a governor declare a state of Nash, uh, a state of emergency and uh, basically petition the federal government for assistance okay anyway the last thing that I want to talk about as it relates to the Articles of Confederation is this issue of settling Western lands now the one thing that I want to bring up when it comes to this particular point is the Old Northwest Territory. Now for your notes, the Old Northwest Territories, the future states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, that's the Northwest Territory. And um, keep in mind, it was the Articles of Confederation that said Congress, or the federal government, gets to integrate those states into the United States if they want to become future states. And so in 1784, what we get Congress, or what we get out of Congress, is something called the Northwest Ordinance. And what this says is really two things. Once you hit a specific number of people, 60,000 people for instance, then you can go ahead and petition the federal government for statehood. So once there's 60,000 people that are currently living in Ohio, Ohio can go ahead and petition the federal government for statehood as long as as it outlaws the institution of slavery. Okay, now that is very, very important and very much worth writing down. One of the things that the Northwest Ordinance said was slavery would be illegal in the old Northwestern Territory. So the future states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, those are all off limits to slavery even before they become states. 
So part of the provision of getting into the country, if you're in Ohio, is that slavery is illegal, and it had always been illegal there. Now, one of the one of the reasons that I'm telling you this, and it's very important, is from 1784 forward, what you've got is Congress and the federal government telling people, telling Americans where slavery is legal, and more importantly, where it is illegal. Now, this line of thinking will continue. It'll continue in 1820 when the federal government initiates something called the Missouri Compromise. It says anything south of Missouri's southern border would be a slave state. Anything north can be a free state. It'll continue on into uh, 1850 when it says California is a free state and slavery is illegal in California. And it's really going to survive until a really important Supreme Court case ruling that comes out in uh, 1857 entitled Dred Scott versus the United States. And so what I want to leave you with here is it's kind of ironic considering this is a document that was set up for a weak central government, the Articles of Confederation, I mean, yet it really does give Congress, this the central government, this really important power with respect to telling Americans where slavery is legal and not legal. And so for right now, that's where we're going to leave it, but I will um, end this discussion by explaining there were a significant amount of um, uh, American leaders um, by, by, by the time that the um, 1780s roll around that understand that this is a problem. These Articles of Confederation are a problem. And so what you're going to see here in short order is a rise of a nationalist faction and these people are going to come together, primarily in Philadelphia, but come together trying to come up ways to strengthen the power of the federal government to save the United States from economic, financial ruin, but at the same time preserve the liberties and the rights that we were so concerned about as we saw the power of the British government grow in the pre-war period. So that's where we'll leave it.